welcome. My name is Mike C. Kleiner. So good morning live streamers and YouTubers and anybody else that watched this. My entire purpose in doing these uh, fundamental live videos is to make you better and to try to share proper fundamentals of you know, competition handgun, defensive handgun, defensive rifle, uh, shotgun, etc. By the way, we're going through the cycle. Right now we're in the defensive handgun cycle, which you know, in today's uh, era and world, with all of the things going on, and my heart is out and prayers are out to uh, those that lost uh, loved ones, this is really, really important content. This is one of those things where if you're watching this this morning and joining me live, that I would really hope uh, you take the time and not necessarily share on Facebook, although you can do that, but just let someone know about this. Let someone know that we covered uh, defensive handgun carry considerations and gear. Next week, I'm going to be talking about the grip and the draw process. You know, I carry in the appendix position, but I'm going to be talking about uh, carry positions as well as how to effectively draw from those positions. And the only way we're going to make a difference, I think, as law-abiding, uh, motivated, well-trained gun owners is to train ourselves and to get as many people out there as possible um, that, uh, you know, that, that love life and are willing to be armed and prepared. So please, uh, if there's any way you can help me influence the hundreds, if not thousands of people to do that, then however you have, whatever access you have to your email list or whatever else I'm asking you directly to share either this content or the live restream uh, re, uh, replay on uh, YouTube. Whatever you want to do there, please. Um, the only way I can, you know, be sure that maybe one of you is armed and well trained somewhere where my family might be, if bad things happen, is to make sure you see this kind of content. Okay, so today we're talking about defensive handgun, gun setup, carry considerations. I'm going to go into some bonus material, and we're going to talk about home defense handgun. And uh, as always, safety first. So please. No live ammo or weapons in your dry fire area. I've got a few different guns I'm going to show you. Actually, one of my old carry guns, the seven-piece shield. This is unloaded and clear. I have an empty magazine. Um, secondly, I'm going to show you another previous carry gun. This is one of the ULC Sentinels made by Wilson Combat. This is unloaded and clear as well. And then I'm also going to show you my current carry handgun. This is one of the EDC 9s. This is one of the X-Series handguns with the external extractor, okay? So I'm gonna talk about this as well. This is unloaded and cleared as well. So do me a favor, if you're gonna be dry firing or handling guns or doing whatever else, please double check that you are unloaded and clear now. I actually had someone in the comment section of this Facebook Live last time, I'm not sure if you're watching, kind of get a little bit pissy and, and tell me how stupid I was for using live ammunition on a live stream. Had he rewinded and actually watched the safety briefing that I do every one of these live streams, he would have saw that they were dummy rounds. So for those of you that are seeing this, or those of you that see the comments in the future, if you see someone like that, please let them know. Safety is our biggest rule. Um, good morning to the ACSS and the AWS members. Coin members, shout out to you. Post your coin number if you would. Tell me, Mike, I'm here. If you're new to this live stream, tell us where you're from. I'd love to know what state you're from. If you want to know more about me as you're watching this, go to my website, shooting dash that's like a hyphen, performance.com. And of course, for any information about the program, this stuff comes from. This is the defensive handgun training program we're going through now. You can go to MikeCCleaner.com. If you like what you see, if you like the material you're seeing for free, consider the full program because I think it will make you that much better. Um, remember, these are the basics. Uh, so, you know, understand that while I'm not going to go into super advanced stuff, I'm going to talk about things in this live stream, the next several in defensive handgun that will truly make you a much better defensive hanging shooter. Of course, today we're talking about carry gear and setup and how I carry. I'm gonna show you my holster, my mag pouch, my belt. I'm gonna show you my two different carry guns that I've carried for the last little while and why I carry those. You can ask questions about those. Talk to you about the reek test. And then I'm gonna show you a, um, a home defense handgun safe as well as light setup, okay? So without further ado, let's talk about um, the more important or one of the more important things in terms of carrying a firearm and that is the system you use to support the firearm okay now there are three key pieces of gear that I carry on a regular basis in terms of carrying a gun and I'm not talking about my light and my, my knife I'll show you those two if you want to see those this morning but uh, I start with a support system that I can rely on rely on to truly support the gun 
Uh, and let's talk about what a good carry belt has to have. Uh, number one, it has to be adjustable, right? Because sometimes we move from, you know, maybe your, your summer weight to your winter weight, you know what I'm talking about, right? So I want to have a carry uh, belt that's adjustable. This particular one is adjustable in terms of taking that Velcro strap, loosening it, and I can actually pull and loosen it up like this, and that extends the belt, where if you can see what's going on here, the, the belt here is actually hooked on a small sewn piece of web gear. Okay, and this is a, a belt made by PrecisionHolsters.com. I'm not sure if you can see the logo right there on the belt itself, but this is my current carry belt. Now, one of the second things uh, that I look for to carry belt is some serious strength and rigidity. Um, this, this belt legitimately, and I'm not exaggerating, is strong enough where I can go in my gym, my home gym, and I can loop it onto the, the home gym setup, and I can literally do a pull-up. I can hang my body weight off of this belt, okay? Um, it's an incredibly strong belt. Um, so I want to have a, a strong belt that also offers some pretty good rigidity. So let's talk about rigidity, right? I'm not sure if that's a full word or not, rigidity. Meaning, what I mean by that is, when I put the belt on, it has to be comfortable enough, or like on the small of my back and my back, that I can sit against a chair, you know, or the seat in a car, um, and, but it, you know, it's still rigid enough where there really isn't any flex of the belt. You see this, like I'm twisting the belt pretty hard, there's not a lot of flex in this. Now, Precision Holsters makes a few different belts. They make actually a holster, a belt exactly like this, that's thinner and not quite as rigid, um, that is for you know, full-time carry considerations, okay? They make one that's a little bit thicker, that is more of a, um, you know, I guess maybe um, more carry considerations, but maybe heavier gear. Like if I was wearing you know, a heavier Glock 22 fully loaded in the mountains of, mountains of Montana, or a 45 or whatever else, I may carry the heavier belt, and then the third one they just sent me, and I'm, I'm not sure if it's fully released, is actually one that's so rigid, it's perfect for competing. So it's something I might consider wearing an IDPA, because in IDPA or com competition, we don't want any flex in the belt, okay? So that's, that's number one. You have to have a, a good belt that will carry your handgun. I mean, I'm, this is the one I'm demoing, but I'm wearing one right now. So I've got my Precision Holsters belt on right now, okay? Now on my belt, um, I normally carry, as most of you know, we're going to be talking about the draw process and the grip process in the future uh, video by next Wednesday, I believe. I'll, that schedule's online. Got a question about belt. Jacob asks, any recommendation for belts with lower back issues? Jacob, I would go with the same belt, but I would go with the, the, the minimum reinforced model. Basically, it's still going to offer a bunch of rigidity in terms of the belt itself but it's not gonna have so much thickness, it's gonna put a lot of pressure on your lower back, if that makes any sense. Now, um, one of the things that I talked to them about doing more briefly, and I, I, I think that would be good to investigate or look into, would be a belt that has, you know, the back portion that goes against your spine, maybe a little bit thinner, but very, very strong, and then have the rigid or reinforced areas of the belt uh, where you actually carry the firearms, if you carry on the strong side, okay? So that's, that's what I would recommend, but I'm telling you, you know, the, like the one I'm wearing right now is a little less rigid than this particular one. Um, this is the second version they sent me. And the one I wear every day doesn't give me any back issues, you know, like I used to have. doesn't push against my spine, okay? So the second thing we need to have is a good holster system. Now, once again, these are made by Precision Holsters. Full disclosure, by the way, these guys do sponsor my podcast. If you haven't checked out my podcast, you should check out my podcast. But I don't want to sit here and show you stuff without telling you they are a sponsor. They don't sponsor the Facebook's lives. They don't tell me that I have to carry this. I can carry whatever I want. Nobody tells me what to carry. And I carry these holsters, okay? Um, this is actually what's called the Ultra Appendix Inside the Waistband Holster. It's got some purpose-designed features, meaning um, it actually has a buildup on the lower portion of the holster that actually presses the gun into your body. It's actually got a little buildup behind this, this initial belt clip that does the same thing. So in the appendix position, you know, what you want is you want a holster that actually takes the gun and presses it slightly into your body and then against your body as well. So you don't have, for example, you know, the butt of the handgun extruding or pointing out and then printing on the shirt, right? I want a holster that actually allows me to carry but takes the gun itself and pushes it against my body this way and this way. Um, and that's what this holster does. Now this one actually has plastic clips but these suckers are very, very aggressive plastic clips, 
And um, one of the things I want to tell you about plastic clips, and for some of you that have a clip on your holster, I would recommend a snap, like a leather snap or a, maybe a plastic or a, a rubber snap that effectively can be snapped and very, very um, strongly holds the holster in place. Uh, if you go with metal clips, that's okay, but some of those metal clips actually have a little piece of metal that juts off the end of the clips, so you can actually pull the metal clips open to get it on and off your belt. Be careful with that, because those metal clips, you can actually cut your hand when you're doing your sweep process, but they also catch on shirts, okay? So I'm a fan of, you know, these kind of clips. These are very, very strong and robust. When I clip this on my belt, I do not want it to come off my belt, okay? Uh, so when you're, when you're selecting a carry holster like this or something where you're wearing an inside the waistband type holster, consider selecting one that is, uh, that is difficult to get on the belt, slightly difficult to get on the belt. Because if it's slightly difficult to get the holster on the belt, it's going to be difficult to pull it off the belt, if that makes sense to you. Because we want to have to be able to retain the handgun and keep the holster on our belt. I'm not a big fan, for example, of paddle type holsters. I don't have one out here to show you. But I'm not a big fan of paddle holsters because they get ripped off the belt very easy. I also typically carry a single magazine pouch um, and I carry uh, a 10 round magazine pouch in the pouch. So I'm going to show you my carry gun here in a second. And then typically a, a fully loaded about you know nine round magazine plus one in the chamber in the gun itself. Okay so this is the ultra appendix inside the waistband holster. They also make outside the waistband holsters that are pretty slick and some other great gear. So if you want to check these guys out, go to precisionholsters.com. If you go to precisionholsters.com forward slash cclander, you're going to see my actual gear. you actually see me, okay? So, so when you holster, is the pistol in or out? Um, so I think, and I think that was Elky that asked that. So I think when you're asking that Elky is, like when I put the holster on, is the gun in or out? My recommendation is that the gun is out of the holster. Um, you know, I typically, I have a, I'll show you my safe here in a second. I have a quick access safe uh, set up in my uh, room. So I take my loaded carry gun. When I'm done, I draw, I open the safe, I put it in there, and then I shut the safe. So I don't load and unload it. When I go to carry and leave the house, I take that same gun. I've already put the holster on my belt. Typically, it's probably on my belt. Uh, and I holster up. That's pretty much a simple process, okay? Um, so that hopefully that answers your question. So precisionholster.com, single uh, uh, mag magazine pouch, ultra appendix inside the waistband holster. By the way, when I adjust this, this has adjustment screws on it. I'm adjusting it as tight as I can adjust it, yet still draw the handgun out of the holster. I want it tight. I want it to retain the handgun, okay? So if you have questions about carry belt, holster, or mag pouch, please throw them up there now. And Elke, you're, you're welcome for that. This is one of my original carry guns. And a couple things I want to talk to you about defensive handgun carry systems. Uh, number one, the single most important thing that your carry gun has to have is reliability. You know, when I talk about, you know, defensive handgun carry considerations, I always talk about the REAP test. REAP stands for reliability, ergonomics, accuracy, and power. REAP. R E A P. In order. Now, number one is R. R stands for what? Reliability, right? Reliability is the single most important thing that your carry handgun has to have. So let me ask you this question. Do me a favor, type it in the comments. If you say, okay, Mike, my, my carry gun is reliable, right? What does that actually mean? What should this gun, this little ULC Sentinel, made by Wilson Combat, by the way? Shout out for my beautiful sponsor, Wilson Combat. What should this gun be able to do before I am uh, going to trust it to carry the handgun? Should I be able to fire 100 rounds through it? Should, should, should I be able to fire a million rounds through it without any malfunctions? What is a reliable number of rounds so I know, okay, this is a completely trustable gun? Type it in your comments. I want to know what you want uh, you have to say that. So that so, is number one. When I'm testing a carry gun, it's important that I give the gun the advantages it needs. Okay? I can't use crappy ammo, crappy magazines. All guns are going to fail. Paul says 500 rounds. I like where you're going, Paul. I like 500 rounds. I think that's a good number. 
Okay, 200 uh, rounds to your new Generation 5. So you're, you're shooting a Gen 5 Glock, which I think we would all agree, you know, the Glock systems have been known for uh, reliability. Nobert says infinite. Man, that's a lot of rounds, infinite. So to have a handgun that's never malfunctioned, and I have to say I've never actually done that. I've never owned a handgun that's never malfunctioned. Elkie says a thousand before EDCY, SIG X carry. So I'm liking what Elkie's saying right there. So here's my recommendation. And this is actually, and Richard says 500. I like, I like your answers, folks. This is my EDC 9. Uh, and this is not the same as the high cap X9, but this is a, a the X series gun. There are a couple features about this that make it more reliable. Um, and a thousand rounds for me, for my reap test, is pretty much the minimum round count. So here's what I, I look for. If I fire good ammunition in quality, clean magazines in a relatively clean and lubed gun, I should be able to run that gun for a thousand rounds. That's one, zero, zero, zero. A thousand rounds with no malfunctions. Okay, that's what I'm looking for. Now, if I, if I went to the range and I bought a carry gun and I did a 500 round practice session without any lubing or cleaning, magazines are hitting the ground, I'm doing reloads, and the gun ran, I would probably carry that gun after I had a chance to clean it. So understand that it doesn't have to be a full thousand rounds, but I think that's a really good number to play with. One of the things that, um, that I want to point out though is a lot of people, when you look at that thousand rounds, a lot of people are into these torture testing, right? So they take a handgun, I think Glock started this many years ago, they load the gun up, they throw it down into a mud puddle, they pick it up and they shoot it. I, if a gun runs when you do that to it, great, kudos to the gun. I mean, I've had, you know, 1911 style systems. I know a lot of people poo poo in 1911s that have ran in conditions that are absolutely crazy. Matter of fact, some of the original 1911 systems, when they developed them and they were testing them for the military use, were put through some torture testing and some reliability tests that were almost unbelievable. But of course, they were. A very very loose tolerance a high uh, 45 ACP which is probably the more reliable caliber in a, uh, a 1911 style system but they ran and ran and ran and ran but the point is if you fire that 500 rounds in the practice session you're probably good to go now a few things that make this gun my my carry gun of choice number one uh, and you may say well Mike a 1911 might be inherently less reliable than uh, you know a Glock or a SIG product if I have a good ammo good magazines and the properly designed gun. This is made by Wilson Combat, so I trust this sucker. Um, for me, they're very, very, very reliable, okay? Number one. Number two, think about this for a second. I spend probably a 500 to 1,000, if not 2,000 rounds per week shooting a 1911 style system. So I am constantly running my 1911 style system. So what better gun or what gun to, uh, would be better for me to carry than a 1911 style system. And I'm not saying that's the only gun I've ever carried, but certainly it makes a lot of sense. Uh, now, if you're carrying in the appendix position like I do, the benefit of a 1911 style system, if you choose to take the time to practice and really be familiar with that system is, it has you know manual safety. So I've got a manual safety on the thumb, I've got a manual safety on the grip, I leave them both active. I don't ever deactivate safeties on guns. So I'm carrying a manually safety handgun um, with, in addition to something that has basically a half cock notch. So if the hammer somehow broke and fell, it would hit that secondary notch before it hits the firing pin, okay? So just a, a, a thought, you know, for me to carry in the appendix position. Now, in terms of my carry gun, if you look at the carry gun number one or carry gun number two, you're going to see that they both have a pretty robust sight system, right? So if you look at the rear sights on those two different carry guns, they're uh, both fixed sights. They're both uh, very, very well designed. They're both sturdy. They, they give me a good sight picture, but they're aggressive and robust enough where I can actually take that sight, I can hook it on my belt or the corner of my pocket, and I can actually manipulate the slide of the handgun. So one of the things that I look for in terms of a carry handgun is I want a sight system that I'm going to be able to see well. Now this is a fiber optic front sight and a fixed rear sight. I'll talk about that here in a second. But I want to be able to see the sights well. And number two, I want to be able to work or manipulate the gun with one hand only 
by hooking the rear sight on the corner of my pocket or a belt or whatever else. That's important. Now, if you look at the sighting system in terms of how this one looks, right? See if I can give you a better view or a visual view of this. Now, of course, I have that rear sight and then I have the front sight, which is a fiber optic front sight post. So that fiber optic is actually very, very robust in terms of being able to see that fiber optic. Notice how you know the fiber optic actually picks up the light that's here in this room, where if you compare that to the second gun that I have here, this is one of the other guns I carry. Now this one is a, a the same robust rear sight, you know, but this actually has a front sight that is not fiber optic. Now notice right now, the front sight is not as crisp and clear on the camera. The same thing the camera sees, your eye sees. So if you look at the difference, you know, between this gun and the other gun, let me see if I can actually hold them up right next to each other, right? The, you know, the fiber optic is going to be pretty definitive in terms of your ability to pick, you know, that fiber optic up. I know this is very difficult for me to do on camera. Let's see if I can do this, right? It's just more robust in terms of what it picks up. Now, here's the deal. If you study, um, um, and JP, that's exactly right. JP just made a comment. Fiber optic is great for older eyes. If you study defensive handgun situations are used for a civilian, right? A large majority of them, like a significant majority of them, like 99% of them are probably in lit conditions. That doesn't mean it doesn't happen at night, but at night it's in a gas station that has a, a, a light like this above you, or it's daylight during the day, or in a room that has a light turned on, or in a store that has a light. So my take on it is, if I have night sights on a handgun, on a defensive carry handgun, and these are night sights, that night sight glows, versus my fiber optic, okay? The night sights on the handgun are, while not a bad idea, not necessary because for me to utilize the night sights, the, the, the ambient light has to get to a low enough level where I probably need a flashlight to illuminate the thread anyways, right? I need to get out my carrier flashlight. So the large majority of situations where you may have to use a defensive handgun, especially as a civilian, probably happen in a condition where the fiber optic is going to give you a better visual reference, quick reference, and focus than the night sights themselves. So I have a fixed rear sight that I can manipulate with one hand, and I've got a fiber optic front, if that makes sense, okay? Yeah, older eyes. So Mike Buford just asked, older eyes. Exactly. Hey, listen, I can say that older eyes now, right? I'm about to turn 48 years old. Here's the thing for you all, but you'll love this. I just got my first shooting glasses that are corrected. I know I say that live on Facebook. I'm telling people it's crazy. So I'm wearing a corrected lens, and we'll talk about this in a future live show, by the way, in my left eye. So yeah, I can say older eyes. I know you resemble that remark, Mike. So anyways, the fiber optic on a carry handgun might be a consideration for those of you with older eyes, if that makes sense, okay? So, we talked about the sight system, robust sight system. Um, of course, we talked about the REAP in terms of the reliability. The, the handgun has to be reliable. Um, in terms of uh, ergonomics, what I mean by ergonomics is I look for a system that I can reach and I can manipulate the systems and controls with both hands. Now notice how I switched hands and I can manipulate my safety with both hands because I have an ambi safety. So if you're carrying something with a, a manual safety, be able to operate it and do all of the things to include hit the mag release with both hands, right? So that means good ergonomics of the firearm itself. Um, in terms of uh, reliability, by the way, this 1911 has an external extractor, right? From Wilson Combat, interestingly enough, they don't necessarily say, or my contact there doesn't necessarily say for example, that this external extractor, I'm not sure if you can see that external extractor under my finger, is inherently more reliable, although I believe it to be so, than the internal extractor that you might see on a 1911 style like this. But what the external extractor does is it makes cleaning and keeping the inside of that extractor area a little bit cleaner, okay? And I believe it actually offers more consistent spring pressure to make this gun more reliable, if that makes any sense. Okay, um, so I have a question I'm going to pause and address. So someone just asked about the, 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 the actual um, size of the rear sight. So let's talk about that. Let me give you a good visual view of this real quick. In terms of the size of the, um, 
the rear sight notch, right? I want a robust rear sight notch. Let me see if how close I can get this for you. See that? Look at this. This is this is darn hard to do. I'm adjusting my camera to the right, to the left. There it is. Oh, look at that. Up. Oh. This is like reverse brain engineering stuff here. Anyways, you can see the rear sight notch in this rear sight, right? That rear sight notch is very, very robust, meaning it's a big, it's a deep U in the rear sight. That's really important to me. And the, the, um, the bigger uh, rear sight notch, the faster I can actually see the front sight and the misalignment between the front and the rear sight. The downside to that is on extremely precise shots, there's a lot of light gap. So I need to learn what it looks like to have the light center, excuse me, to have the sight centered enough to get those hits. So to answer your question, I like a deep U wider notch, okay? Uh, this front sight is probably a 0.1 in thickness, maybe a little bit over, 0.110, something like this. On my competition uh, handguns, I've got a 0.90, I've got a much thinner one. Uh, Robert R uh, Robert Roberto, sorry, messed up your name, man. Asked, these are all standard Wilson Combat sights. This is their standard fiber optic front, and this is the the, the U notch. Where they, got, I think it's called the the battle sight or the battle U or something like that. I'm sorry about the terminology. And by the way, you know, because of the serrations, the serrations on the sight of those lines actually cut down on the glare of the sight itself. Okay, so great question. Okay. Um, anyways. So I've got the external extractor. You know, ergonomics means I, I can reach all the controls. Remember, reliability, ergonomic, okay? Accuracy and power. In terms of accuracy, a lot of people ask me, hey Mike, how accurate you know, should your defensive handgun be? And my answer is, your defensive handgun, if it's made by any of the manufacturers out there, you know, whether it's one of these 1911s or one of my old carry guns, this is my old m 9 Shield, these guns, are all more accurate than you are, right? They could probably shoot better than you can in terms of accuracy. So what is accurate? Let's actually address that question. So in terms of the accuracy of a defensive handgun, we want to be able to hit a six to eight inch circle in the high center chest, right? Now, how far away are you going to be fighting? Well, most of us civilians, or maybe if you're in law enforcement, probably need to have the ability to do that at 10 yards maybe up to say 20 yards is typically my standard can be farther but can be closer as well so if your handgun will shoot that you know a six inch group let's say you don't maybe you're not a great shooter yet you haven't worked your drills yet a six inch group or let's even challenge it more a small three inch group on the head at 20 yards it's plenty accurate enough and probably more accurate than you are. Not many of you can go shoot a three inch group at 20 yards right now. But I guarantee that if you carry a handgun from any of the major manufacturers, your handgun can do that, okay? So that's, that's the accuracy requirement. Now someone just asked about caliber. The last one in the REAP test, thank you for asking, is power. What kind of power do we need from a carry handgun, right? Should we carry a nine? Should we carry a 40? Should we carry a 45? Should we carry a 46? Right, what's a 46, right? Come on, chuckle, give me one of those laughy faces. I'm kind of trying to be funny here. The bottom line is, if you look at the ballistics, these guns are all nine millimeters. So this is a nine millimeter handgun. You can probably see the caliber on the hood of the barrel itself. The ballistics with the current nine, right? If you look at what the FBI is issuing and carrying, you look at what a lot of these law enforcement agents are carrying out there on the street, they're finding that nine millimeter, nine millimeter ammunition with the current ballistics with certain manufacturers is nearly as good as some of the old 45 ACP out there. Now, granted, a bigger, heavier bullet will always hit harder. Let's face that fact. A bigger, heavier bullet will always hit harder but it also reduces your capacity in your handgun, and it also increases the recoil you're gonna feel with your handgun, okay? So we need to have, we need to look at the teeter-totter effect of bigger, faster bullet versus less capacity. For example, when I carry this gun, I have 10 rounds total in the gun. Nine round magazine, one in the chamber. If I switch the same size gun with the 45, I think I would have a total of seven rounds in the gun, right? So you're gonna to have to make that decision, but for me, a 9mm allows me to carry more ammo. I know shot placement is the key. 
shot placement is probably way more important. My ability to take that front sight, put it in the rear sight notch, align it, and then press that trigger is probably way more important than carrying Magnum 45 ACP. That said, if you're a 45 guy or a 40 person, go for it. By all means, carry this. Just understand that you need to be able to control the recoil and accept the fact that you're going to have a reduced capacity. Me, a 9mm does what I need to do in terms of defensive handgun. I'm completely and totally relying on that handgun bullet to do its job. Now that said, that's in the area that I live in. If I go hiking in the mountains of Montana, your question or maybe my answer changes. The carry uh, uh, ammo that I'm going to carry in the mountains of Montana where I may run into a grizzly bear with my cousin grizzly bear Todd Orr is going to be different than a 9mm. I'm going to be carrying probably a 45 with some really heavy bullets or bigger. You know, 40 would probably be the minimum caliber. Okay? Now let's talk about your bonus today. Um, this is actually one of my home defense handguns, and I'll show you the quick access safe this sucker is in. Um, this, this, by the way, is unloaded and clear. I've got an unloaded and clear chamber, if you can see inside that. But I wanted to real quickly um, talk about empty magazine, uh, low lights in terms of a carry gun. If you have a handgun system that you keep for home defense purposes, uh, and by the way, I, I do recommend sticking in the same family of guns. So maybe if this is your carry gun, this is a light, small gun, very easy to carry, very much like my Compact 1911, then my home defense gun probably should be something similar, but the same platform, like maybe a Smith & Wesson, you know, M&P 2.0, bigger, robust grip, more round count, higher capacity gun, okay? Um, but what I want to talk to you about is the ability to carry a light that is activated by a grip switch. This one happens to be a light and a laser. I'm not sure if you can see the laser dot on the wall over there, but this is actually a grip activated light and laser combination. Okay. Now, what I want to talk about is I put an Instagram post out recently. If you don't follow me on Instagram, go find me on Instagram. Yeah. Large majority of the guns I see on Instagram have some sort of cool Wismo Glock or whatever and a weapon mounted light that doesn't have a grip activation system. And a lot of people say, okay, I'm going to activate the light with this finger, right? Now this light I can activate with the button and I can turn it on and I can turn it off. But I want you to think about this for a second. If I'm searching my house and I, I have a full grip on the handgun, notice how the light's not on. And I go to shoot this handgun and I extend the handgun and build my grip, the light comes on. I can also, as I'm searching, illuminate. And all I'm doing there is I'm taking that middle finger, which is gripping the handgun pretty tight right now, not activating the light. And when I want to search the area, I grip and activate the light. Okay. But notice how I'm doing this and handling the gun. I'm transferring back and forth. I may open a closet door. I didn't have any light, what do they call ADs, light ADs, where I go, oops, I didn't mean to turn the light on. But it's very easy for me to seamlessly search. If I had to defend my head and shoot from a close quarter position, I can still, boom, activate the light and shoot it. Notice how the light's on right now. Where, imagine under extreme stress, me having to go, okay, there's a threat. Now I need to push the button on the light. Oops, I didn't get it turned on. Crap. And then I have to find the trigger. I don't want to do that. I want to, boop, grip the handgun and shoot. 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 That is why I, if I have a light laser combo on a handgun, strongly recommend that you consider, train with, and explore a grip activation system like this. Now, this one is made by Crimson Trace. I also have some great small lights that are made by Streamlight. I'm a big fan of both companies. Okay, This is actually... Uh, Crimson Trace. I think this is actually called the Laser Guard Pro. It might be called the Light Guard Pro. I don't want to miss, miss, uh, say that. But the bottom line is, if you can see, there is a light and a laser combination there. Okay, so it's a light and a laser combination. Okay, so that's the one I have. Uh, this battery's been in there for a long time. Works freaking outstanding. Um, very, very good light. Should I have the safety on or off when I'm clearing the house? In this particular case, I would probably have that safety wiped off, right? 
because it's such a small safety. By the way, for those of you, someone out there wants to make some money on a product, they need to take this small safety on an M&P shield, and you need to make a bigger, robust barrier to that so we can replace that part. Aftermarket replacement part, no brainer. How many thousands of shields do you think have been sold? Okay. Um, so, so, um, and Ernie, I'll answer your question in a second. In terms of Rudy, I want to go back to your question. If I'm searching the house, I actually had to search my house. It wasn't last night, it was the night before. We had a loud noise, something dropped. Now, two things. I don't always run to my safe room, okay, because I have a teenager and he's done stupid crap on a regular basis. So, uh, if I would call the police every single time we heard a weird noise, then I'd be calling the police constantly on my kids. So I, we heard a loud noise, weren't sure what it was. It was actually something that fell off the wall. I'm not sure how that fell off the wall. Anyways, so when I searched the house, 1911 style system, I'm gonna keep the 1911 style somewhat compressed. My finger's gonna be on top of that safety. But I practice, if I ever retract the handgun, wipe the safety off, safety goes back on. If I extend the handgun, safety goes off, safety goes back on. So as I'm searching, the safety's on. So if someone grabbed it and we had to fight over this 1911 style system, safety's still on so I can do some fighting, I could do some striking or whatever else. But I practice if I needed to at close range, protect my head, throw the strikes or whatever else. That's, by the way, that's a future live stream. I'm not gonna get too much in detail. These live streams are both supposed to be fundamentals and here I'm showing close quarters, low light techniques, right? I'm supposed to tell you to go buy my low light book. Anyways, Rudy, hopefully that answered your question. Someone else, uh, asked if I prefer the Smith & Wesson versus the 1911. Um, well, I, I searched the, with the 1911 the other night, but I, they're a different night previous to that. You know, this is many months ago. Um, this is actually very similar to one of my weapon access or my home defense handguns. So this is, this is actually, this is actually is one of my home defense handguns. I know it's smaller, I have less round count in it, but it's one that I have of many guns, because I, I do a lot with different guns, that has the full-time light laser combination. So that's the little guy right there, okay? Uh, in terms of the 1911 Smith & Wesson, I don't know if I would pick one or the other, but folks, I'm telling you, if you have a full-time light laser combo on a, on a gun with a grip activation switch, and you have the opportunity to go to an indoor and outdoor range and do some low light shooting, Shooting with this gun is literally as easy as extending it, boom, 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 pressing the trigger. It's almost unfair compared to having to use a light and shoot with one hand, uh, you know, and this handheld light is not a laser. This light laser combination is significant in terms of its advantage, okay? And I also have them set up so, you know, if my family members, my wife or whatever grabs this gun, literally, they're just gripping the gun hard put the laser where they want to hit, and then fire those shots, okay? So think about that for a second. All right, folks, last but not least, I wanted to show you one more thing here. This is the quick access safe that I have. Now, this one I actually had to remove. So you can actually bolt these down. This has a plug-in, so you can plug it in. This one's made by Gun Vault. They don't sponsor me or give me anything. By the way, Gun Vault, if you're watching this, or those that are the Love Gun Vault, you can reach out to me, right? This first one's free. Next one, maybe I'll charge you. But the point is here, I'm not gonna show you my code. I can open it very, very quickly. There's a little light that turns on inside that sucker, uh, and that's where my handgun is. So typically my handgun is laying in there up against the side. Let's see if I can get this in there. So my, my home defense handgun would be just like this, right? So I would, I would be able to reach in, slide the hand up to build a good grip, come out of the safe, and then start. It's pretty darn fast, okay? Those of you that are just throwing something up on your nightstand or wherever else, probably not a great idea. My guns are all locked up. I think you should do as well, okay? Uh, but it's very, very, very quick access. Um, I do, by the way, have a, uh, I have a pretty big handheld weapon mount or handheld light next to my bed. You know, so I could grab that light if I needed to. If someone was literally on top of me, I'm fighting. I'm not worried about grabbing the handgun. But I can get into that safe and access that handgun and use it or search my home and I can get in that safe in about, you know, a second and a half, give or take, okay? We talked about carry um, gear and how important your carry gear system is uh, to your, your whole 
plan, right? This is what I carry on a daily basis. There's a little bonus someone asked earlier, so I'll show you. I also carry a little micro stream. This is a Streamlight micro stream. Very small light, very easy to carry. I mean, you can literally see how I wore the light down for carrying, right? But still very, very bright. And this is a great little light. This is actually an Emerson wave opener. Uh, a lot of times I carry a Spyderco wave opener that my buddy Mike Janich uh, ground for me. But I had a situation where I lost one with TSA recently. So I went back to the Emerson until I get a different carry. Great carry knife right here, but I have a actually a different system. I'm going to start carrying in the near, near future. Anyways, those are clipped to my pockets. On my belt, I have, or on the, the belt I would wear, precisionholsters.com. The Ultra Appendix inside the waistband holster. Single mag pouch. I carry about 20 rounds on my person with the single mag, mag pouch and gun. And Kirby, just, just showed you this one. I like the wave opener. Okay, I'm not sure if everybody has seen the wave openers, but you can see this. Don't want to hit my wall here. When I open it, the blade opens. Yeah, that wasn't a really good opening, but that, that's how it works. So that's the wave opener. Emerson's great. I have a spider. So spider codes actually have the wave on them. Um, they actually, there's a company that actually made, makes a wave device that you can put on the knife itself. I don't know who makes them, but my buddy Rich Brown has that. But we could share that with you. We also talked about carry guns. Okay, what I go through: the reek test, reliability, ergonomics, accuracy, power has to be reliable first. This is actually my everyday carry gun. Okay. Uh, Christopher, so this belt, yeah, it goes through the pants easily, but I can tell you, when you initially thread this through the loop, this loop kind of catches on your belt loop a little bit, so you just kind of kind of press it down, but it pops through there and goes on the, the belt. So all I do is unhook it, you know, I thread it through the belt loops, okay, all the way around my body, and then this slides in, this keeper inside here, I slide this sucker in there, and then I hook this. And of course, if I need to adjust and cinch it down, all I do is take this strap and tighten it down, or undo it and loosen it up to a bigger belt size. Okay. I should be a belt model. Look how good I am at showing this off on camera, all right? Don't forget to check out the schedule. Go to events on the page. Daphne, good morning. I see you there. Go to events on the shooting performance page. All the future events will be there. I'm going to post some more today. Remember, we got grip uh, trigger sights coming up soon with defensive handgun stuff. I think it's probably one of the most popular lives I do. And then we're going to be talking about carrying, the appendix carry position, and how to draw from those positions. All very, very important considerations, I think, that are critically important. Okay? It is. Have a wonderful day. Um, and I'm going to close with this. Please, if you're watching this right now, how, however you can, we need to get together. Okay? We, we need to commit to you know, love and respect and God and all that good stuff. We need to be armed. You need to be armed, okay? You need to arm your friends, your family members, whoever's comfortable and safe enough to do that. That doesn't mean we need to be armed and not trained. That's probably more of a danger. We need to have a plan, and we need to get more of these people, more of you and I, okay? We need thousands of people walking around uh, that are armed, that polite society. So however you help me get the word out there, please, please, please do it. Uh, maybe you work for uh, Google and you have 8 million on your email list. Hey, Google, come on. I know Google doesn't care about this. Help me share it. You get access to 1,000 people on an email list. At a minimum, go to my YouTube page, wait for this replay to come out, and then forward that replay to all those folks. It's free. It's 100% free, okay? That's all I have. Stay safe, sort your gear out, and practice.